Welcome to the Practice Podcast, conversations probing the nature of practice. I'm your host, Dave Firon. Well, this is uh, another conversation with my son, Dave, but it, in a way it is a pause and reflect over the last several years conversation to when we started to talk about social inaction as a basis for my study of practice and his ongoing interest and occasional study of what constitutes social inaction. So you'll hear a really, I think, very interesting summary by Dave and my attempt to connect uh, what he is saying about social inaction to the practice of practice, the conversational practice of practice, the awareness of context, and uh, the need to be in conversation with whomever is in that moment when someone who is pursuing a particular practice needs to move ahead. And there are people either there to help or hinder, but always uh, with whom we must uh, interact. So here is another and not the last, uh, hopefully of many future conversations with Dave and Dad. Folks, it is uh, a time in March of 2023 that marks essentially the beginning of this podcast series and the connection of my interest and Peter Vale's interest in practice with my son Dave's interest in social inaction. Not that he's disinterested in practice, mm -hmm. But he knows a lot more about what he had worked on for years as he was pursuing his doctorate and beyond. And in recent podcasts, hopefully you've been following them, you've heard Dave talk uh, very uh, enthusiastically about his sort of side hustle, <laughs> which is to keep an eye on the research and philosophy around brain and mind and consciousness in intellect and intelligence, all of which seems to be coming very much to the fore as the buzz is about artificial intelligence and uh, applications that can now uh, write something or create a song or a poem that some people couldn't detect as different from anything a human could do. So, Dave, First, thank you for the social inaction basis for all this work. Uh, would you remind me and therefore our listeners off the top of your head uh, what social inaction is? Well, um, there's a, the more I read and kind of catch up with um, 20 or so years of, of uh, not having followed this, I, I think there is now something called in an action or an actionist perspective around um I, I would say it's mostly applying to neuroscience cognition um and a little bit to uh, psych psychological behavior and then probably extending out into models of of um evolution um, and and biology more widely, but I don't know that I, I at least haven't come across um, its application to thoroughly into social human interaction. Yes, specifically on language and and conversational talk in in um, uh, language, mm -hmm. and so I think what I define. You know, so, so several years ago, as social inaction still has a connection to that kind of inactionist, sometimes called construct constructivist mm -hmm. um, approach. Um, but I think the the inaction approach is is focusing on what's being what's what is how how can you focus in on talk and and our experience of talk which is a conscious experience obviously a consciously aware experience of of talk um between two or more people as 
a particular sort of systematic dynamics mm -hmm. and the way I use the term an in action refers to three um, common definition features, which all apply, which all can apply to these moments of actually doing talk and doing which talk. are, yeah, which are to act, act as performance. So to enact is to perform for another person who is there um, uh, witnessing and is going to respond um, with their own performance. Mm -hmm. And that this brings forth between uh, two people um, an act in the sense of a, a domain or a realm of, of, of interaction that's focused on what's relevant at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, which is itself the peak of, you know, the entire history of the two people who, started a conversation and from there to all that they had to learn socially to be able to use words in a meaningful way in the first place. Um, and Pretty then nice. it's astounding when you think about it. Isn't yeah. It? But it, 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 <laughs> what all of that, rather than focusing on all of that, if we focus on this moment of performance, then we're focusing on what boils down to those moment by moment words in used in in interaction mm -hmm. um and so that gives us domain of what we're talking about which is social which is literally social in 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 this sense because it wouldn't be there if there weren't two people talking mm -hmm. i mean we could talk to ourselves and it's basically the same dynamics but <laughs> we're talking about <laughs> when two people are talking and so yeah, then, then the yeah. third meaning is is um warrant to warrant like a, to enact a law and in the core context of interaction you know there are models of early linguistics that seemed as though they followed laws or or um especially like how children learned them i think noam chomsky's approach might be characterized as a little bit like that because he kind of viewed children kind of learning these in innate or inbuilt grammatical um uh, uh rules and mm -hmm. and you know more more um ancient thoughts about symbols might say that all symbols had their own meanings mm -hmm. like somehow attached to them and that people just learn the meanings and then use the symbols so that the symbols accurately represent the meanings but mm -hmm. um this is more of a law law like an action in the terms of of enacting law like the rough and ready laws of nature where it's <laughs> what works for the moment yeah but, gets you uh, it gets you on moves you yeah, on gets you but through. also but having those moments you're you're able to justify them by warranting in what came in what came before and what ought to come before mm -hmm. so that as people use a word and expect the other person to understand it they also are able to justify that assumption that they will understand on the basis of what everyone ought to know, given what yeah. I just said. So I just said, you know, words that ought to make sense to a fellow English speaker and yeah. also lots and lots of context that also seems like it ought to make sense at that moment. Mm -hmm. And if you acted in a very unexpected way, I might first try to kind of repair and say oh what well, you, you seem to misunderstand me uh we kind of repair that and adjust to it but if you really persisted in just acting in a very uh as though you couldn't possibly understood what i what what i said then i might mm -hmm. get angry and, and invoke, yeah. you know yeah. invoking the deeper laws be of an, accountability be, yeah, yeah. be another practice on you know like punch <laughs> but yeah, you know or, the, the, that's or, pretty or much like, the crazy nub. what's going on <laughs> yeah well it, if you look at even that moment that you just described dave it's a nub of so much of what constitutes our day our day of of conversations with with lot, who, how many other people we we're uh with in a given moment so that i think that probably down deep there's a, a, a hope <laughs> when you initiate turns of talk that the other person is going to warrant what you've 
what you said and how you've said it. And when that's not happening, up comes another thing that you treated very wonderfully in at least one or two of our podcasts, which is emotion. That, yes. That's that that's where that um, brain study that you've done for since since the late eighties has um, kicked in. That uh, it begins to explain why faces get red. <laughs> either embarrassment or anger and uh you know the sweat glands start to sweat and all of that so in those little moments to moments if that those three stages don't work perfectly well then there's chance that emotions will uh will flavor what happens next and that'll create a different social context maybe in a, two minutes later yeah than, than it was before Right. And it's those emotions that I mean, we notice the emotions when they when they flare up in those mm -hmm. particular moments because they're dealing with, um, I guess we call it an, er an error signal in a way. And we and we feel it and, and it, it emerges um, and people do something about it right away. But what the other aspect I've been suggesting with this is that those those emotions aren't just there for those moments. They're always there. There's always an emotional level um, at, at this first level behind um, social, the, the conversation, social interaction. Mm -hmm. And then as we talked to, about some of our brain studies, such as Marx Solms, mm -hmm. there's something there even deeper in consciousness that is also an emotion that actually literally creates these moment to moments of conscious awareness as we adjust to a world that may not perfectly fit our predictions and it's at those yeah. moments that become the impulse not just to act but to act consciously to have a conscious felt experience of the world that is about those emotional moments Mm -hmm. in addition so so everything else you know how we put together our our perceptions see things see things in, in in their color and shape and everything else is is um has this element of constraint around those emotion emotional moments and that uh, you know it's kind of the, the emotional tone of of that moment um and and of types of emotions too because they're they're some primary types yeah and and that these, and then as you extend up into the complexity of talk, there also seems to be a, a, a complex emotional category that we've talked about as the shame uh, family, yeah. embarrassment, shame, uh, shame appeal to some extent. Or pride, um, which is the, the other, pride and pride. Uh, other end and, of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. But, and it's extending into feelings of, of solidarity or even love um, mm -hmm. to some extent. Um, mm hmm but as as you get into those complex um the complexity of uh words and social interaction those emotions are also generally considered now to be complex in themselves as composites as composites of of more um um uh, i guess elemental emotions that other animals would share yeah um, such as a feeling of separation or anger although anger is probably a little bit separate from from shame and then um or uh even uh, emotions surrounding play because there's there's you know some interesting yeah. implications of how play is is a basic social dynamic and may have to do th with things like power and and the relationship between others in that sense yeah so there's lots so you were dealing with this edge of complexity that all boils down into something that um, for at least for talk and interaction has another interesting feature unlike what's going on in the brain it's empirically there it's in, there's an empirical element that we can see because it has to be seen otherwise you wouldn't know what i said had i not said it so you can look at this empirical right. moment to moment talk as at least a a a sign of of uh, you know a, a source of understanding what that organization underlying it might be to the extent mm -hmm. that it emerges it's like the tip of an iceberg 
Yeah. Um, in a way that, you know, with brain studies, they'll try to do that with like functional MRIs and showing things lighting yeah. up, but really it's hard to know. <laughs> Yeah, you know, what things is, light up for all kinds of reasons. Exactly. exactly. But at least with talk, you know the reason why they said it because they've already they're presenting their reasons. Yeah. <laughs> We're presenting our reasons as we talk. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of uh your dissertation and uh the, you I think were in some ways a pioneer of the use of the video, even though it may have been somewhat common in that conversation analysis subset of study that you were doing you you would uh speaking of empiricism you would capture you know quite a lot of video actually and then you would take out a segment and you would uh code what people were saying in terms of those creating those moments together how did you come up with that idea because here we are today saying it it, it really is the the essence of how we even begin to get along with each other and understand each other. Yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't invent the the method of looking closely at at uh, video, but that was kind of coming up around the, in, in the nineties while, while I was studying it with the other people doing um, this field of conversation analysis in particular, which is a um, field of sociology. Mm -hmm. um, I guess you could somewhat blending into what might be called social linguistics. They had the method early on of looking closely at video, but they had to start with things because they didn't have the digital video that made it easy. Right. They started with things like phone calls just because it was easy to record phone calls and transcribe them and, and look at how people interact in phone calls because they can't see each other's faces. Yeah. You don't have that that extra layer of complexity to have to analyze by people's gestures um, <laughs> and, and facial expressions, mm -hmm. which we now have with Zoom, <laughs> at, at least for that kind of communication. And then, of we course, do. face to face is is, is its own thing. Yeah. Um, so in the early and then they had like some canonical um, uh, videos that people would look at over and over, like like this <laughs> group of pe friends having a a chicken dinner <laughs> yeah. and, and, and a couple others that they just kept everyone kept studying because they, they produced a good transcript and then and then they would study that in, in classes and in study groups write papers on them um yeah and so there's these canonical things um uh and then but now um of course it's easier to to study this and and now there's software which i wish i had when yeah. Um, now that really makes it easy to 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 work with um the video and code it and everything else um so and so that you know in general that method's very common but what the way of looking is is what's what's new and i and i suppose That's what it. yeah what i was doing a little differently and and um wish i had done more was really blending more of the conversation analysis with what um tom chef uh uh, was focused on was looking at the social bond and emotion dynamics, really right. pulling together um, those visible features, um, and also those and the way it creeps into people's talk, and then um, uh, other aspects of conversation. Mm. No, I, I think you you definitely put together a unique uh, mix uh, there uh, because. I mean, I, of course, I'm your dad, so I remember almost everything that you've shown me, but those videos still come to my mind. When you mentioned play, for example, was one of the uh, uh, emotions that work to develop um, social bonds. I, I pictured the two, I think they were like two or three year olds in a, in, inside a pen. Yeah. Uh, like a play pen, but, and, they were, you know, their language was basically, uh, mm, huh? yeah, yeah. <laughs> but because you had the video and you took it, uh, you could show that when they broke out, one broke out with giggles. I mean, it was like the other yeah, one. Was, they were, yeah. What they were doing is one, one, I got to find that video. They were shaking, they were shaking the fence. Yeah. They were shaking the fence and one of them was shaking the fence. They were both shaking the fence together. Yeah, having like, fun. Gin, 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 and they were laughing. But then at one point, they like looked at each other 
And then kind of, you can almost see how they said, we're doing this together. Yeah. This is fun because we're doing it together. <laughs> and, That's it. And it's like, it was like this pre-verbal moment of, of real clear interaction of them kind of defining, um, defining something that we would do verbally, but they couldn't do it verbally yet. They were too, too young. So it was, um, no. or no. at least not fully. So it, it was great. I, I, I don't know if I've, I don't have that video. I think I either lost or something. I got to see if I'm, I'm storing <laughs> some of up. your backups here. All right. I got to dig in my <laughs> office. <laughs> I got to dig through. Yeah. But, but you see that, that in itself kind of brings us to where we started this conversation because we're looking at human behavior in uh, various organizational moments. Now, there was no moment. Uh, for those two babies that would that would be their organization moment until they noticed each other. Mm -hmm. And without words, I'm guessing, because you're the expert, that that maybe was the glimmer of a friendship. Maybe it was some recognition uh, of togetherness mm -hmm. that, um, you know, how we all crave and we have in every in every eon of, of human existence but it was an interesting thing to watch now i will add in to the conversation uh where i think practice connects to what you've just described uh the fundamental way of thinking that peter bale set up in order to have all these conjectures about the nature of practice itself is that it is a conscious a conscious choice to pursue results in uh, a way that you will deal with circumstantial change and situations as they arise, and you'll continually uh, keep yourself moving forward and therefore learn and grow. And so the um, conscious choice, where does that start? And my hunch is, if you could peel down to where, and I've done this in a way with all these people I've had on the podcast, when I ask them, well, when were you first aware uh, of the seeking uh, feeling that you had, the feeling that you wanted to do more of a, this particular thing, whatever it may have been? Uh, one person said, I, I love paperwork. I always have, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and so you if you could be there at the moment that when she was five, that she started shuffling papers, and sorting things out, you, you, there might've been a conversation right there that someone else said, Oh, you, you know, Petty, you really, you really did that beautifully. And then there's the reinforcement. And the next thing you know, 30 years later, she's uh, ha handling logistics for a shipping company. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm leaping to a lot of, uh, amateur conclusions here but i i think that without this this is sort of the back to you without the practice of conversation itself conscious choices are less likely to be made and reinforced results are are what if you can't describe them and put them into words and say okay my score was x uh Everything that flows out of what we think about practice requires it to be done with others in uh, context. Now, last point, he says that where that practice lands you at any moment in time provides the context for your what you must do next. Mm -hmm. Now, this awareness of context doesn't have to come in those moments like you described before. It's it it's got to be socially enacted. Otherwise, there's no such thing as context for someone. Yeah, I think that's right, and, and I think that's the dilemma: is that we we want to kind of understand these in summary ways, but really we're we're describing things that are these histories of moments. But we and and that is another aspect of again of this the idea of the tip of the iceberg over over so much of our lives are so completely implicit their potentials um they are 
in in a almost literal sense like an entire city cities and and worlds and communities and in our brains turning along doing bits of things uh, on their own that we're flying over and and kind of seeing broadcasted up to us every now and then mm -hmm. uh as, as experience um and 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 are in a similar position to understanding what other people do as we talk to them um mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing that broadcast coming out of what they say um so turning that back into what what is practice and what is those what are those moments of consciousness i think not what peter Vale is acknowledging is it is those moments yes those are, and and don't it it's maybe it, it it will always become misleading to ignore that there are those moments and just come up with a structural functional uh uh map of you know the type of person who ends up liking to do logistics yeah, yeah from, logistics from, yeah but um and you know and there are real personality differences and temperaments and and things like that and competencies um that make people you know better kind of mathematical and such and others less mm -hmm. so or mm -hmm. and then again we talked last time about ian mcgilchrist's work on brain hemispheres and then right. you really see you really see the brain divided up <laughs> quite a bit into some of those preferences where um the, the uh the left side is really like for lin lin logistics of the left side the left hemisphere is very um oriented towards putting things in sequence and categories and, mm -hmm. and manipulation of the world in that sense mm -hmm. almost the exclusion uh, almost literally to the exclusion of con context apart from the right hemisphere's ability to send messages <laughs> in regular interaction showing oh here's the context and here's the next context and here's several other contexts so it's right. almost like there's a whole part of your brain providing context to the other half that's that's kind of turning along and putting the pieces of the puzzle together yep and and the, the degree to which the two have to talk to to each other conversationally is perhaps more than a metaphor to, to how we have to do things socially um as well with the same tools the same um vastly complex uh capacity to put words together into grammatical sen sentences um i mean i could maybe this time to kind of give a list of all the different so several different parts to making that happen and then um and, and yet <clears throat> experiencing it as a as a whole as a as a stream of not only meaningful understood language but the actual conscious experience of that which is you know where that practice has to emerge into something something that's mm -hmm. real for the moment i think we um made the right choice when we started with something that um i'll tell you the the original reason that our web page started out with social inaction i had bought several domain names one of which was inside knowledge which related to the book that steve cavallari and i wrote and then there were several with an action on social inaction that i was kind of hoping that you and i could use together and so i just said no when we build this web page we're going to build it around social inaction and that then um is where it all began <laughs> and 200 and some uh, conversations later and a book uh, on practice as a way of being uh we've come we've come far and i i'm just thrilled that you can teach me something every time we have these conversations and it gets me excited about wanting to learn more on my side of the the conversation and combine a few of our universes in those moments like the one we've just recorded now and maybe we're creating, some might call it a literature or whatever they want to do to sanction what we're saying to each other and recording and sharing with the world. My point of view is that you're making me a better person and 
hopefully I'm doing the same for you. Yeah, because I'm getting it out of my head after after letting it <laughs> ferment for it, it, it was so years. It, it, it was stuck in your craw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and now and now being able to binge all these uh, interesting talks on on YouTube, um, yeah, without having to sit down and read, which I don't have as much time for. No, um, and which you, it triggers my my the punishment of my grad school years of having to read so much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now I can soak it in and and then and then uh, yeah. spit it back out. Well, uh, let me give you. A con- <laughs> I'll give you exactly. I'll give you a conjecture about that. And what we did is we released uh, from other things you had to do to reach the point of making a living. We released your interest uh, where you had held it. And in a way, over time now, the last two years or so, we've made that another practice of yours, not just uh, the practice, but it's another practice. And, and it's developmental in that sense that with, with the curiosities now uh, stimulated and the ease of finding ways uh, to to uh, learn using mm-hmm. YouTube, you know, it's like I'm free. You know, I yeah. I, uh, I don't have of, to write a paper and publish and stand no. up and teach this stuff right away in front of no, students no. Or, yeah. plus do committee work. <laughs> in I a still, way, you know, it, it you know what that life's like. You're still yeah, working well, in universities all five, these years. Yeah, and the nine to five job is its own thing. But yeah. at least this is. Uh, but the, nice but the, free, the freedom, the freedom, that's yeah. it. And, and, you know, there are people who's one aspect of what they've had to choose consciously to do for consistently challenging results is not at all that satisfying. Yeah. But it, it is it's performance a level higher than, a, you know, being a low, a low paid employee. But the, so they'll do that, but they'll do it because it then funds uh and gives them a platform for them to do what they're really making themselves into which is a great fisherman a great golfer a great right uh cook um and and that's wonderful about humans isn't it that we have this freedom to make these choices and whatever we choose and stick with really becomes more and more how we define ourselves in the world so we have uh recorded another conversation it will not be the last time we do it dave because i'm sure by the next time i reconnect and say hey let's do another one you will have discovered some other really cool thing (laughs) about intelligence about uh, communicate about the mind about um the difference in inaction and the inactivist and you as a social inactiveness which Mm -hmm. i think is kind of interesting to probe and i'll just keep on figuring out more ways to let people know about our work. That sounds good. Thank you. And maybe one day I'll put some blogs up on our website or something. Yes. (laughs) Well, okay. I know I was a teacher once with holding a grade book up here, but I would love to see you're, you're actually a terrific writer. And, but you know, where do you squeeze in the time? You're a very busy guy, but uh, I'm glad you squeezed in the time for me, Dave. Yeah. It's easier this way. (laughs) Sit down, talk, record. (laughs) There you go. There you go. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to the Practice Podcast, where we discuss practice with a capital P. If you'd like to hear more, listen in on Spotify, Automatic, and Apple Podcasts or go to inactionresearch.com slash podcast dash page. And if you'd like to learn more about social inaction and the nature of practice, head over to inactionresearch.com for more information. Thank you for supporting this show. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Oh, oh, how could I have forgotten? Our digital book on practice as a way of being is now available. You'll find it online at www.mylibrary.world. I worked on that book after Peter passed away, and I think you will find it a unique and very, very mobile reading experience, since it's wherever your screen is in hand or at hand.